Okay, good evening, everybody. Welcome. Welcome to Clay Art Center. We're just going to uh, wait for people to start filing in. We're here with uh, Kyle and Kelly Phelps. Uh, it's very exciting um, to have them here. They're also in this uh, month's edition of Ceramics Monthly. This is the cover here. And here's the feature inside uh, for their exhibition that's cur currently on show at the Otterbein uh, University. Right, so I'm going to hand things over to Kyle and Kelly now. They're going to take us on a journey. The uh, Tonight's talk is race, class and the blue collar. I'm super excited to uh, listen and see and share in their work and I'm sure you are too, so I'll let you guys take over. Thank you. Oh, alrighty. Whoops. <clears throat> Excuse me. So um, I'm Professor Kelly Phelps. I am in my 17th year at Xavier University where I oversee the sculpture program. And um, I'm Professor Kyle Phelps. I've been with the University of Dayton for nearly 19 years. And welcome to our studio, the world's smallest studio by far. Um, but before we get into this, I'd like to uh, give an extra special thanks to uh, the Clay Art Studio, uh, Ms. Regina, um, for, for taking us on and, and, and having the interest in our work. But also I'd like to give a special shout out to, to Jim at Standard Clay and all the other art centers, Baltimore Clay Works, Finland, so on. So um, it's really important to um, keep that network of community artists together, especially clay artists together. And, and especially during this pandemic, which has been absolutely bonkers. So um, what's gonna happen is that Kyle and I are going to um, give a completely sanitized, non-academic version of what our, our PowerPoint really is gonna be about. So we're, 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 we're siblings, so we're twin brothers. So obviously we're gonna bicker and we're gonna fight and over talk each other. So I will give a majority of the presentation and then Kyle will do Q&A. So, um, Without further ado, we're going to get inside of our kind of our early thoughts, how our work actually originates. So our work really stems from our early um, inspirations from the WPA. So it's a really big step backwards. Um, Kyle and I grew up in a small kind of factory farming town where Chrysler was the biggest industry in the town. So art really wasn't on anyone's radar and it certainly wasn't anywhere public, with the exception of a few key places like the public library, as well as the uh, post office. So you go in and you see these great big, really wonderful works of art that depicted our people, working class people, and especially of uh, that during the time period of the WPA. So we're talking about roughly 1930s to the middle of 1940s so before everything kind of shut down. So we're really interested in that time period. So it is kind of a throwback, but at the same time, it's what's happening right now today. So obviously many of you guys, if not everyone's seen this uh, mural, um, this was kind of like our first real big introduction to art that explored our people, working class people, black, white, Hispanic, rich, poor, you name it. It was all based around this, this, this mural painting. So um, it's interesting because we um, first got involved with this mural by accident. I think mom brought this giant stack of, of National Geographic magazines and they had some sort of big cover spread and boom, it just blew our minds, the inner workings of factory life. My dad worked at, or our dad worked at Firestone and Chrysler, um, really up until he retired and passed away. So <clears throat> it's a lifetime commitment of factory workers and factory work, but we actually really never got an opportunity to see kind of that inner kind of struggle or toil that went on from day to day. So a lot of our imagery is gonna come from those studies of those factory workers. Uh, Kyle and I were really kind of enamored with, with what dad went through every day, put on the same kind of factory working clothes and his smell, um, the colors of the factory clothing, just that 
whole notion of the kind of the working class hero. And there were a whole community of these working class heroes. So just want to keep that in mind. Our whole body of work, for the most part, is going to be depictions of these factory workers. And to give you an idea, um, we just recently had a chance to go back and, and visit the, the Dayton, Dayton, the Detroit Fine Art Institute where the Diego Rivera mural is. And it's huge. If you haven't had a chance to go visit it, it is absolutely gigantic. So this is kind of like ground zero for Kyle and I. This is kind of like Mecca. This is, this is a really important kind of, um, kind of a journey back into kind of the Rust Belt and to see this big, huge inspirational mural that really sparked over 20 years worth of work that's been a complete life um, commitment. Our work also kind of talks about religion. <clears throat> and it's funny because our work really investigated um, kind of a classical views on, on Christianity and, and things like that. But when Kyle and I would go to church, when we were forced as little kids to go to church and sit and be bored to tears of what the preacher was talking about, some scripture that I'm sure we didn't pay attention to, we were really enamored by the artwork. And I'd say that's our second type of um, experience of art was in the church. So we, you know, we had these, these great big stained glass narrative, you know, stories that, you know, that were going on, as well as these reliefs. So our introduction to sculpture came about through, through looking at these, the, these narratives. This brings us into the invisible people. And it's something that it took Kyle and I probably 20 years to think about who, who, who are we? We're, we're not only African Americans, we're, 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 we're a part of a whole culture of invisible people, makers who really don't get the actual respect um, that they, they definitely deserve. So factory workers, garment workers, uh, textiles, uh, coal miners, people that make America run, those are those invisible people that are often underrepresented, especially with, within the arts. And the factories. So when you see this, you probably think, think well, wow, this is like such an eyesore, but this is kind of like, this is our Home Depot. This is our, <laughs> this is our Menards and Lowell's. So this is where we actually go and retrieve our art materials. This is what informs our work. So oftentimes when you look at our work, you're going to see remnants of factory windows and, and the clear story windows and, and water towers and things that will give reference back to industry or the plant that occupied that particular town. So this also became very devastating for Kyle and I to see because we grew up in Indiana. So right in the middle of Rust Belt, USA. So these factories were huge factories. I mean, some of the factories were over a mile long. So imagine taking the Empire State Building and putting it on its side. So, and then the industry dry up and then go away. And it left lots of, lots of this. Just remnants, empty shells of what used to be. So you'll find a lot of our work will have reference back to that old corrugated sheet metal or rusty um, tubing and things that you would see from, from the plants that still are, are still standing. So this is what really, Kyle and I really take these sites as kind of a historical sites. I mean, they're very important. This is America, so not just African American, but this is this is America. So we wanted to really capture these because a lot of these plants are being scraped off the earth like they never existed. And that that is American history. So that's what really pains Kyle and I and, and pro really promotes our work. So this is Bork Warner Gear. If you look way back into the distance on the left hand screen, that's literally you're looking at a factory that's almost a mile long. 
So this was the plant that my father was, uh, our father was forced to retire from. So at the height, this was uh, mid 1990s, NAFTA came in and took out two thirds of the plant. Um, what was left of the plant moved to Mexico. The other part of the portion of the plant remained until it closed in early 2000. So it became really a kind of an important thing for us to think about. This is the interiors. So once again, Kyle and I actively go in and we archive and we collect these materials. And once again, those materials help inform our work, help set the kind of the stage and the narratives of our work. So oftentimes, um, Kyle and I would retrieve materials from these sites legally. Sometimes we'd hop the fence and retrieve materials uh, illegally, illegally, but it became necessary for us to archive these, these plants because, as we said, these plants are being scraped off the earth like they never, ever existed. So we've had local police and sheriffs and you name it, security officers come up to us and ask us, you know, what are we doing here? And, you know, why do you have this bucket full of material? Thinking that we're recyclers, not recyclers, scrappers, you know, trying to kind of pillage what's left over to sell. So we always have to like be wary, wary and, and like explain that we're visual artists and we're using this to, to help tell our story within our work. So all of our work starts out with photo documentation, and then we actually go to the sites and we literally start to archive and collect found objects. So ready-made objects like that chain or the fence or the lock itself, they, they all end up being a component of the work to bring in that sense of authenticity or sense of time, place, and history. This is kind of a cool shot. So if you, if you can understand what 1.2 million square feet really looks like or how big that is, literally think about the Empire State Building on its side and times that times seven, because there's seven of these factories, one right after the other. So these were huge, huge, big forms that took up a big chunk of the community. Which brings us to our work and really kind of our life's, our, our, our life's dedication to, to these big factories and they become really kind of like ghost towns. So Kyle and I really kind of pay a lot of respect and kind of homage back to these working class people and these structures. Whoops. So Kyle and I, um, that's kind of a hard one because uh, our father passed away in 2000 and 15. And I always remember that lunchbox that he would carry. And it was an old school metal lunchbox that the thermos kind of, you know, set in the middle or in the top of the lunchbox. So and it sat there for years, like, what am I going to do with this? So we decided to kind of make studies and you'll see gives reference back to what found objects are and how beautiful those simplistic objects, those everyday objects can be. So we started to um, think about ceramics, painting, sculpture, collage as being one thing rather than separate silos. So we're interested in making art that just happens to be ceramic based. So we don't catch yourself up with, with titles and things like that. So a lot of our works will be studies of factory workers. It's funny because Kyle and I had college degrees and we ended up in the plant. And oftentimes um, on our breaks, we'd take our sketchbook and we would have studies of, of factory workers. So when we were starting out, we had a formal college education um, we were heavy into painting, um, but at the same time, we were really interested in sculpture. So we tried to figure out a way, does everything have to be glaze? And our answer for that is no. Why not utilize all of your toolbox of art skills and just focus on the art making? So of course we sculpt the figures out of clay, but we also bring in our, our painting skills. So we paint with everything from airbrush to oils, to acrylic, 
to non-traditional materials like motor oil and, and cutting oils and anything that we can find to enhance the figure. So not only are you getting the visual, but you're also get, kicking the other senses. So when you come up to our work, you'll get the other senses kicking in. So the sense of smell, it'll have that scorched oil burnt kind of smell to it as well. So to, to go back on this, a lot of our figures are in high contrast to the background. So that gives reference back to some of the plants that we worked at were so dark and scary and just flat out dangerous. So primary casting facilities or heat treating facilities where there was very little light. In fact, our father worked in the, in the middle of the plant for 23 years with no windows. Psychologically, that could work on a person over time. So we want to kind of explore that as well. This is a part of the John Henry series. This is at Asheville Museum. And once again, talking about other forms of working class, other forms of blue collar. Um, this happens to be a, a whole series dedicated to John Henry. These are some other studies. So we took a big hit and we went into graduate school. So graduate school kind of opened our eyes because we had certain expectations. So in our minds, we thought we had expectations. We're two large African-American men. We have to make angry black man art. So, I mean, there's a lot to be angry about, but there's also the fact that Kyle and I don't represent every black experience that's ever happened in the United States. So it's hard to just pigeonhole ourselves into one category. Our people were those working class people every day that we saw every day. You know, although we shared this paint job, we still had a direct connection to those working people. So we started to make these working people, but we didn't have a sense of context to a background. So they became nifty figurines, with the exception of having um, any type of reference to a background. So that's why those found objects help support the figure itself. So it's funny because going back to this figure, we had this big review in, in Louisville, I think it was the Leo Arts and Entertainment Magazine, and the whole magazine was great, and it was like fantastic way to boost your ego because they're like the twins' work is so detailed, blah blah, much like humble figurines. And it was like it was like the needle scratching across the record, like what? Two giant black men and making humble figurines this big. So it taught us a good lesson to think about um, how do you place your figure into a context to bring some sort of of uh, continuity with your work, but also authenticity to your work. So a lot of our work will start to have that, that reference back to sheet metal and found objects that came directly from the plant. So here's a good example of your typical trash, scrap, corrugated sheet metal. So that is kind of our starting point all these factories have a sense of time and a place in history. So we wanted to make sure that we, we, we archived that back into our work and then juxtapose that with a found object such as those work boots or the for sale sign. So you guys remember the, the fence with the, um, the, um, the leasing sign on it. So literally that for sale sign was outside of a factory fence that had shut down. So we uh, appropriated that for sale sign. And those boots are our father's work boots. Um, that were taken right after he retired. So this piece is called Boots of the Proletarian. So going back to a lot of these pieces, we were thinking about, let's look at this one. Let's think about the, those pieces that we, we, we were interested in as far as looking at like religious pieces and the little niches that they occupied were so shallow. So Kyle and I really love classical art, but classical art really didn't speak of who we were and our experiences. So we had to think about those architectural friezes that have relief sculptures in them and bring them into a modern day, kind of a modern day theme. So all of our people, and one of our people in my family were either coal miners or they worked in the steel industry or automotive industry or the railroad industry. So a whole rich history of working class people 
that represented our family. So that became kind of a, another recurring theme. So what you're looking at is a ceramic sculpted figure painted with oil paints and then the wood planks in the background are from an actual railroad stake crate that we repurposed into that flag motif in the background. So a lot of these pieces will give reference right back to religion as well as working class people. And this is a good example of how our father worked in the plant religiously. I mean, that was his thing. I mean, never missed a day, was a union man, went from one plant from 20 years to work on another plant for 20 years. I mean, you've got nearly 60 years of working inside factories. So that became the, the, the church for him. And work was the religion. And its parishioners were, were the workers. So it became really important for us to kind of tell that story and continue that on. So all of these figures take up a really shallow you know, amount of space. We're talking about no wider than four to six inches. So although they look really dimensional, they're really not dimensional at all. Much like our, our reference, we're referencing back to classical art, especially uh, architectural friezes and, and, and relief work. So we also thought about surfacing. So we're, since we're talking about such gritty subject matter, we also have to talk about the surfaces that, that, that go along with those images. So when Kyle and I were first starting out, everything was polished and super smooth. And, and then it just looked like a China doll that was dressed up in working class clothing. So it really struck us that, man, we really have to think about those other really kind of hidden materials. So if you look at it, there is the underlying tool, tooling of our hands and the tools that still show through. Um, we make no efforts, effort to polish things back out. Um, but also we actually take shavings, metal shavings that we find on the, the shop floor and we just will wedge that right into the clay body. Because once again, you're bringing some of that ghost, that sense of authenticity right back into the work. And many times that, that metal would actually oxidize through the paint. So it would kind of rush through. Here's that John Henry again. Fire so we talk about fire in processes. So the little nails that you're seeing here, you know, they were perfect. If you ever try to replicate a round circle 16 times, it's, it's just a pain in the ass. Why even do it? So we started looking around like, wow, I'm going to literally pull the nails out of the, the crate that's holding this thing together. I'm going to fire those right into the form. So those nails became actually fire ends. And we use that throughout all of our work now. So all of our ceramic figures will have some sort of fired in element. <clears throat> This is Digger. But also decal work. Um, Kyle and I were at one point in time, we would actually hand paint all the little details, little flags or cigarette labels. Like, sh screw that, we got a printer. Why don't you just print it out and just um, attach as you feel it's necessary. You could scale things down. We as artists create all these rules, but at the, at the same time, it's really ridiculous. Uh, we scream about all this freedom, but we always go back to someone else's rules. So I think ceramics for us has been really um, a blessing because it's really accepting of other disciplines. So everything from drawing to printmaking to photography, to photography it can all be blended. And at the end of the day, we're just making art. So. So we do a whole lot of studies with uh, coal miners and the coal industry. In fact, um, the, the sheet metal came from a piece of uh, metal from Kentucky that Trump actually um, visited. It was the plant that um, Trump said he's going to bring coal back. And sad enough, like last year, it, it collapsed and there's no coal in that town anymore. I mean, the mine literally closed down. So the subject matter, you're going to start to see figures that are, are seated or they're standing up against the wall or they're idle. And that's all because of factory workers want to work, but there's currently no work. 
so it's not because people are lazy or people are immigrants or any of the other things that people like to stereotypically um, point their finger at. It's because people are waiting for this opportunity, especially working class people. So a lot of our workers will be, you know, smoking a drag off their cigarette or lighting their cigarette or just waiting with, with all their work garments on, just waiting. We had a person ask, well, why do you make so many people smoking their cigarettes? Well, the cigarette is like the only prized possession you had during your eight to 12 hour shift. And it's the time that you could actually kind of um, do your thing, smoke your cigarette, relax while your machine's running. Um, it was one of those things that everybody needed. Oftentimes the machines are running so loud, you can't even sing a song in your head. So that cigarette became kind of that crucial kind of relaxation point. So we had a lot of moments where we knew that um, plants were closing down. So um, once again, Kyle and I had the opportunity to actually see firsthand how factories were at many times were the great providers, but at the same time, they were so cruel to their people because people were actually absolutely expendable. You know, our father retired and the moment he retired, boom, they got a machine from Korea to run 23 hours out of the day, you know, with one hour setup. So lim limited, literally three shifts, three bodies. So it became really painful to see, you know, the last people working on a skeleton crew, the last people there when the plant shut down, you know, cleaning up, you know, because the plant's never coming back. This is a welder, um, a welder study, and we had a lot of people, um, international people, a lot of Polish people who were in the skilled trades working on the plant. Um, so when the plant shut down, we were able to go through their their lockers and find things like that cutting torch. Really inspired the piece, the, the actual welder standing there, as well as the sheet metal that that plant came from. So this is um, a good example of how paint just fit the bill. I'm sure there's some crazy mad scientist uh, glaze guru who can come up with that perfect matte colored Carhartt, but why not just paint it? I mean, I, I don't have time to go and do all that calculation. You could, you could do mason stains, you could do whatever you wanted to, but sometimes just do what you want to do to get the job done and don't worry so much about categories. Once again, that idleness, um, people just waiting for that opportunity. We also embed a lot of flag imagery. So it's, some of it's like, I guess, kind of a dead give, a giveaway. Others, you kind of have to kind of dig for it. So you'll see this flag motif that will pop up over and over and over again. If not literal, it's gonna be in, in the people that we sculpt their clothing. So we feel like we're patriotic, but in our own way. And that's represented either through our color palette or using the actual flag itself. So one thing about this particular work was um, Jesus's helmet. We had that helmet and inside that helmet actually had pictures of his children. So the whole notion of family and how that was really prideful and important for this particular person. So that really hit home because this is, he's. This is a man who was uh, deemed the, the great provider for the family, so it became important for us to, to make a piece like that. Good example of the, the contrast, the pop between the dark background versus the, the high color scheme of the figures. Found objects embedded within the work. And just traditional references, um, if you go back, um, if you really look close, there are a lot of classical poses that we just totally ripped off and we modern, modernized them. I mean, literally, Rodin. Augustus Rodin was another big influence. So you don't have to discard your history. You can, you can always enhance it and make your own. 
This is uh, an up close uh, surface treatment. So it gives a good idea um, about what we, um, we do as far as surfacing. You'll have embedded steel wool, you'll have embedded little splinters and shavings of metal. And the cool thing is they will actually start to, over time, they will start to oxidize and bleed through, permeate through some of the paint. So once again, you know, Kyle and I first started out, it was like, wow, we were like polishing the crap out of the figures. And they were like, the more marble, the better. It's like, and then it was like, totally did something counter to what our, our ultimate goal was. So talk about that kind of rough history. Liking more loving, um, Michael Moore was a big kind of um, influence, particularly for one movie. It's the Roger and Roger and Me documentary that he did during Flint, um, the struggles with Flint, Michigan. This, this came out at the same time that Kyle and I were in grad school and we got a chance to go to Flint um, and go to a lot of the, um, the, the Detroits and a lot of the other Michigan boroughs that had factories in them and retrieve materials. So this is the, the coal miner shrine. So real Kentucky coal that came from that plant that Trump promised to bring back. And what you're looking at, that actual elevator shaft is actually a drill box that had been clattered over with metal that we found from the site. So once again, we're, art does not have to start from Home Depot or, or Lowell's or, or the local hardware store. You have to get it from the site. It's gonna smell different. It's gonna look different. It's gonna be authentic. And that's what's really important for Kyle and I. This brings us into our, our conflict series. So all the while Kyle and I were doing this, and this is like a 20 year span, a snapshot. But all the while we have these other things going on. Um, like the, the, the racism and classism that, that exists here in the United States. So this piece is called After the Dream. So once again, it gives kind of a commentary after the moment after Obama took his presidency and his presidency was over, it's like this big question mark, you know, what's gonna happen next? And we're all living through that right now. So going backwards, um, also giving references to all those working class people outside of, outside of the, the blue collar theme or the traditional kind of steel worker. So this would be your janitors or your custodians or housekeepers, housekeepers people that we, we don't really think twice about or just pass by without giving a second thought about them. Those invisible people. But also we had a chance to think about those, well, they're, they're also invisible people, the homeless people that are out there in the world right now. So we've got homeless people, um, a particular guy that I've seen every day driving into work, I get off my exit and then there's Terry panhandling at the corner right underneath the, the interstate. So every day I would try to give him what I had and then I got to know this guy and you know find out that his name is Terry and that he was a CNC machine operator. Um, but the plant closed down and then he became an alcoholic and then he lost his, his, his family and his house and come to find out that he was also a veteran. So it was like a ripple effect that, wow, this is really happens to everyone. So a lot of our work kind of pays homage. So the work really does kind of take on like a shrine to those homeless people or a shrine to those um, agricultural workers or, or um, domestics um, that, that work in the, the hospitality sector, so. And just give reference back, all that stuff that populates his cart is trash that we found at his feet. So once again, taking from where we're at and creating artwork from what's there. So this is Carlita, which talks about also immigration. So Kyle and I will think about immigration and how that plays into this whole notion of America and then the American worker and how these people are coming not to kind of just feed off of our society, but also contribute and work. So we got into a lot of a civil rights thing. Um, this is a, a piece that came about a couple of years ago. It was a commission for the 
the Lorraine Motel in Memphis. It was called uh, The Moment. So it was the moment right after um, Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. Once again, that big question mark, what's going to happen next? There are so many of these that I'm not even current on the name. So the death of Eric Gardner is a big influence. Uh, Flandreau Castile, Walter Scott, George Floyd, and there's a zillion more that's just happening every day. And it's happening so often that we don't even think twice. It doesn't make the front page anymore. It's just other news. But for Kyle and I, this became our big kind of our, our civil rights moment because we are actively living through this right now. When we were in grad school, we took so much criticism because we were making that expected angry black man art. Um, we're gonna talk about civil rights that didn't happen during my time period. We're gonna talk about slavery or the Yamasad or, or Middle Passage. All those things were, were hard and harsh and true, but didn't really directly impact me like, like this happens right now on a daily basis. So a lot of our work will have reference, once again, to that American flag, but also kind of that classical kind of a relief that you would definitely see in like architectural niches and things, but in a modern day setting. We talk a little bit of everything about uh, police brutality, um, um, gun violence. This is all happening every day, but you know, it doesn't even really make the pages of the newspaper anymore. Um, the over militarization of police departments in the United States, things like that, that are really impactful now to us now. It's not the old water hose and the German shepherd being sicked on a black person. It's police and military gear that are in direct confrontation with, with mostly peaceful protesters. So this brings us into our process. So once again, right above that kind of a tray of tools is a sketchbook. So all of our work starts out with general sketches and then we actually get into the physicality of the clay. It's funny because our, our studio is kind of like, um, hmm, we live in a white suburban neighborhood. So oftentimes our neighbors probably think there's some sort of meth lab or something going on. But our work is straight up production. When we get into the studio, of course there's, this is sanitized y'all. So it's a lot of bickering and arguing, but at the same time, it's about mass producing. So Kyle and I will work on, you know, up to four pieces in a rotation, kind of like an assembly line. And thank God that we had the experience working in the plant because that's where we developed our work ethic. Kelly and I kind of developed this kind of subconscious okay to start a project individually, but time it goes around, we've contaminated just enough that, you know, there's not one authorship. It's not a Kelly piece. It's not a Kyle piece. It's our work. And that's how we've, we've always done things. And you can see the various stages of kind of newness. Obviously, this is much wetter, wetter, the piece to the right, versus the piece that Kyle's working on. Or is that me on the left? But oftentimes, Kyle and I are working kind of so close. It's like, God, why are you breathing so hard? Why are you sweating on me? Get off of me. <laughs> it's like you're just on top of me. So, But we have that OK because it's for the work. So. So we like to um, think about our work as a production. Therefore, we're never bored because there's always something to do. So right now you're looking at a wet stage. And then as, dra as clay starts to dry, then you get into the whittling out and, and undercuts and, and finding those sweet spots. And right now you're looking at the underside of that same form where we're getting ready to devise a, a dig out system. So we formulate all of our, excuse me, all of our pieces solid. So we could work quick. A lot of people do it just the opposite. They build an armature and then you got to figure out a way to extract the armature. Like, screw that. We go and work directly in the clay and then we excavate out all of the clay to make the forms hollow. And you can see that, um, that loop tool on the guy's head. We're actually coring out the inside of the head so the head doesn't blow off into the kiln. 
And this is Christmas time, so everybody's favorite time when your piece survives the firing and it's all bisque. So once it gets bisque, it gets wiped down really well, and then we get into sanding and priming. So once we establish the priming, then we get into underpainting, getting those flesh tones in, and then we start formulating fabric and other smaller details. So our work is really done in stages. So notice that there's no clay in the studio while we're doing the painting stage. So we never counter, um, not counter, we're, we, don't, we don't kind of cross paths or contaminate other scenes with, with dry clay and paint and so on. This is a firing process. You can see the bolts in that helmet. Two minutes left. But doing really, um, trying to do the studies of shadows and undercuts, uh, learning to kick the figure out of, away from the board so you get space behind the feet and legs so you don't have work that looks like hieroglyphics. Sorry, I've been told they're pressed for time, so. But everything from pickets to strikes, you name it, we, we are definitely interested in, in depicting those images. I think the cool thing, aspect about the work that we're producing is that it's, it's, it's really works in kind of a regional way. So we take our work, especially the blue collar work, and we take the work up north, obviously it's about the steel industry and manufacturing. If we take it down south, it's about textile mills and cool. coal. If we take it further to uh, the Midwest, Midwest, to the west, and the, the, the coast regions like uh, Louisiana and Texas, it's about the oil industry. So the work really kind of transcends its kind of initial intention. So this gives reference back to um, this big crate as a transmission housing. So there's the clay figures and they're getting ready to dry out. But that great big pallet that you're sitting there actually houses a transmission and the parts. So what we do is we found that tray and then we cladded that tray with the metal that we found from the site. And of course we attach and paint the figures. So once again, there's the fire in process. That's right after uh, the work comes out of the kiln. All those little black dots represent the metal that we actually left inside the bisque layer. That's that fire in process that we talked about. So once again, they get nice and crispy, and but they still maintain that cylindrical shape. And this is how we marry the figure with the background. So this is painting painting and decal stage where we're attaching um, little decals and things that we don't want or have time to replicate with paint. We will actually scale them down and get them going. So uh, this is two figures of the same theme, but you can see the figure to the left and the figure to the right. So it's exactly the same type of figure. This is in production mode. So we actually go and we paint, do all the underpainting all together. Then we do all the clothing all together. So on. And we utilize, we try to utilize all the tools in the toolbox. So if we want to airbrush, there's no rules that say you can't airbrush. If we want to uh, use uh, acrylics and stains and, and oil paints, then you should be able to do that. I know there are a lot of purists that will think that, oh, this is like blasphemy that you're painting on a ceramic form. But it's, if it's for the betterment of the work, I mean, we're not drinking or eating out of these. They're, they're sculptural forms. And that's us. Thank you so much, uh, guys. That was really wonderful. Thank you. Kyle and Kelly, thank you so much. That was an absolutely amazing presentation and uh, really appreciate you being here with us tonight and sharing so deeply. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you to everyone for attending tonight and thank you for your donations as well.
just close up.